What up everybody, it's April Dawn. New hair, who this? Ha! Let's talk about it. This is the assassination of Gianni Versace, episode eight. Yes, before y'all ask me, yes, I got a press. Okay, get into it, bitch got her wig split. Look into it, look into it, get into it. Go ahead, and I added some extra hair at the bottom. This ain't all my hair, y'all. Don't get that excited. My hair only goes to, like, right here, okay? I, I added some tracks in the back to make it more full and more dramatic. You can see it's already starting to frizz some, but it's okay. And the type of hair that I use to add in is the Naked Nature Wet and Wavy. Um, just ask me about it in the comments, and I'll, I'll give you some information in the description box, okay? So, this week's episode was, once again, the Andrew Kunanen story. We saw very little Versace. It feels like they just kind of sprinkle him in there just to let remind us, oh, this show is supposed to be about when he got killed, but it's really about the person who killed him. But, nevertheless, it was still a good episode, so let's go ahead and get into it. So, we start off in 1957 in Italy. This little part is about Gianni Versace, and the whole episode is really about, like, the juxtaposition. You know, Ryan Murphy likes to juxtapose things a lot, so he's juxtaposing the relationships that each child had with their parent or each person had with their parent right so we see Gianni as a small child his mother realizes that he has a talent for drawing she nurtures that talent she encourages it and you know helps him become a better artist even when he's ridiculed at school and called like a freak I think in real life the teacher called him like a sex freak or something like that even when he you know deals with those things at school and you think in 1957 y'all you know, my mama was born in 1955 so they like she he would have been in his early 60s so it wasn't really that long ago when people still face this type of discrimination and you know things like this and then we talk about a foreign country we ain't even talking about America's who have you know made all of these supposedly supposedly made all these strides and you know civil rights and human rights or whatever anyway his mom nurtures his talent she tells him after the teacher tells him that she tells them hey well this dress you were designing is beautiful let's make this dress together so they decide they're gonna make a dress together we don't know if that actually happened in real life though okay and then we flip to 1988 in california or 1980 excuse me in california andrew and his family are moving into a new home and you already noticed the separation between andrew and his brothers and sisters because his dad is making his two brothers, his two sisters and brother work, you know, and the mom work themselves. But Andrew is sitting up in the house reading the damn book, y'all. Okay, he ain't did nothing. He ain't lifted his finger. So mom says, where's dad? He's with Prince Andrew. So, nah. He even rode in the front seat in the truck. That was crazy to me, that he even rode in the front seat in the trunk of the car. And had, Modesto is his father's name. Modesto had the mama ride in between them. Child, she couldn't even sit in the damn seat. Child, I cannot. When they get to the new house, Modesto brings him into the house. He brings him into the room. That's when the mom is like, okay, well, where's your daddy? Oh, he with um, Prince Andrew. So they go into the room, takes him into the master bedroom and tells him that you, you know, you're going to have this master bedroom because every morning when you wake up, I want you to know that you're special. You look out this window and know that you are special. So he already set him up for destruction. All right. That night, y'all, they showed the mama was in the other little room crying. She was in the little side room crying, child, sleeping on a, a, a damn bed cot, okay? Looked like she in a damn hostel somewhere. They had two girls sleeping in the bed and one boy sleeping on the floor, and the dad slept in a room with Andrew. If that's not the weirdest, most freakiest shit, like... That just threw me off right there. In the middle of the night, Andrew wakes up and see his dad, like, putting up American flag. Like, his dad is obsessed with the American dream. Like, he had this thing about, you know, being proud and being American and, you know, having the success and the lifestyle. That's what his dad is really obsessed with, the lifestyle of being rich. Uh, the next day, Andrew and his dad both go off to their respective interviews. His dad is interviewing with Merrill Lynch, and Andrew is interviewing with the Bishop School. And he, they both want to get into it, so... You know, this is where Andrew gets his talent for bullshitting, okay? Because the dad is like, oh, the dad's story was pretty interesting, though. Modesto's story was, was pretty interesting about how he went to the Army or the Air Force and he made 97 cents or, or, or $97 a month or something like that, but he wanted to be in the Army. Now, we don't know if the shit was true or not. He could have just lied and snuck and got his way to America some kind of shady way, child. Whatever story he told him, that little story was cute. Now, Andrew, you know, he doing the same thing. He working it back in his interview. It was interesting to note that they asked him what would your dream life be oh two mercedes benz and this and that so you can tell that he's already caught up in this thing about lifestyle you know and if you think about it andrew read a lot of books that was for adults when he was a child so that's probably why he couldn't relate to people his own age because he was just 
so smart that he just was way over over their head child when they get home that night andrew's dad is sitting at the table he looking all depressed with a piece of saying you know i didn't get the job or whatever and you know the mother's like oh my gosh you know i'm so sorry and he tells that that he's just joking and he walks over he puts the pizza up and he opened up this whole thing of lobsters and crabs and shrimps and all this stuff and he's like we're gonna eat like kings we're gonna celebrate and you know right when everybody started getting happy he turns to the mama and is like well bitch you thought i didn't get the job though you seem like you was happy i ain't get the job i said oh shit he 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 like to be the women oh all right i see where we going with this he be tapping the hub side of her head then he said something to her like you don't want to go back to the hospital you thought she was going crazy a little bit again because apparently even in real life andrew's mom had postpartum depression after she had andrew and probably because if you think about it him and his brothers and sisters were so far apart that it probably was a lot for her to have that last baby you know dad he like flip on the mama a little bit and the mama like you know she try to keep it cute you know because she already know daddy won't tap me upside my head later on so she like you know we're just gonna eat we're gonna eat like kings i'm so happy for you and all this shit so after dinner that night andrew and modesto are in the room and he's making andrew Andrew read books basically um he's telling Andrew well no that was later on but he making Andrew read books about the art of conversation and all this type of stuff he's telling him this is stuff you really need to know and you can tell that Andrew kind of just wants to be a kid but his daddy like nah you're not gonna be no kid you're gonna be a grown-ass man you're gonna be you're gonna learn about talking to people and he tells him that he needs to fit in that's the most important thing he can't just be smart he also needs to fit in so that book will be very helpful for him to read the next day the Andrew is at home with his mom and the mailman comes and knock on the door and and um, it's the letter from the bishop school. So it's really weird when his mom is reading the letter. And, you know, she's like, why are you crying? Because Andrew was on her shoulder crying. It was almost like he did not want to disappoint his father. He did not want to disappoint his father to the point where he couldn't even look at the letter. He was crying. His dad is so excited when he comes in. He, like, is elated. He's over the moon. His son has gotten into this expensive school because he's thinking, I'm setting you up for a legitimate life. Because you're legitimately smart or whatever. And he kisses Andrew's feet. Child, I cannot. I said, y'all got this boy all screwed up in his head behind this foolishness y'all doing. How y'all raising him? When he kissed his feet, I was done. At the new job, Modesto is not doing too good, y'all. He, he going to work, you know, he trying to get the customers to, you know, buy his stocks or whatever. This is his first or his first yeah it was his first day at Merrill Lynch and so you know he not making no deals so he basically just started lying you know just this way Andrew get his line from child and he started lying about the man hung up on him on the phone and he just kept talking and talking you know trying to make it look like he was actually making a sale when he's not so he just lying his way alone hmm. he comes home I don't know if it was that evening or an evening Andrew is working on his homework with his mom he tells him the homework away and come on outside he have a surprise for him and Andrew was like what is the surprise and he closed his eyes and he opened his eyes honey and it's a brand new car now mama say you cannot be getting this little boy in no car child he can't even drive and he's like no you gotta make him dream he can dream if you want him to dream you gotta get this and dreaming is the most important thing. she said well don't you think my other kids want to dream they old enough to actually drive like she had two or he had two brother a brother and a sister that was old enough to drive and another i don't know if it was the brother or the sister that was the younger one but but he had two siblings that was old enough to drive and daddy say fuck is you talking about girl i know what i'm doing he yoke her ass up by the neck and tell her bitch you crazy you about to go back to the crazy house because you're weak-minded child and then he goes to sit in the car and tells andrew listen when, you, when your mama had you, she was depressed, she was sick, she couldn't even get out of bed. So, you know, I love my other two kids, don't get me wrong, but they not special like you. I took care of you. I was your mama and your daddy. So, I imagine that him and Modesto had a closer bond because of that, because he had to take care of her through during her postpartum depression. But, like, it's weird. The relationship is weird as hell. The relationship and the bond that they have between them two. And he's basically saying all this to manipulate Andrew and turn him against his mother. Which it works. The mom comes over to the window to talk to Andrew and he rolled the window up on her ass, okay? So like I said, Andrew and his father share a bedroom, which is already weird. They're in there getting ready for bed and his dad is saying, you know, he takes... The, well, he said, did you always want to be a stockbroker? Well, you know, no, not really, but I took the opportunity. I'm an opportunist. He says, the only way you can survive, boom, there you go. A pathologist. Be an opportunist, take 
take these opportunities. He says, well, you know, I like stories. Well, maybe I should write books for a living. And Dad said, well, somebody offer you a million dollars, you can write books, bitch, but don't just be writing no books for no reason. Like, I'm gonna need, you know, like, no, not just to write books, get yourself together. Another thing, you can't do what you really love to do, you need to do what make you a lot of money. And then he starts to tell him this story about how when he burned his foot when he was little, you know, he picked him up and he didn't cry, he didn't make a sound. And then he lean in and say, not a sound. Remember? Not a sound. So, when I was watching the after show, they was like, oh, I meant, thought it meant this. I thought they said like three or four different meanings and one girl was like, I thought it meant that he was molesting him. Like, it clearly, you know, leaned in to him molesting this little boy or whatever. So, I'm not exactly sure. That's probably, I'm thinking, okay, that's what, what was going on. But he was molesting him. Or they're implying that he molested him. Now, the family, you know, they have never said one way or the other if that happened. You know, we don't know if that's true. It's complete conjecture. But... I mean, he do give you chest of the molester vibes, okay? Giving you spending the night in the room with your child. That's strange as hell. So, okay. we go to Andrew in high school. And we and they just showing us Andrew in school to show us that Andrew did not fit in, like I said, with his own peer group. He did not fit in. He shows up to the school to take a picture and the dude call him a faggot or something. And he get in front of the thing to take the picture. And he like, you know, why should you be out? Like, basically, if you're going to call me out my name, I'm going to go ahead and just show out. You know, I'm going to stand out. So, he take his shirt off. And I, and I read that that... It wasn't official picture for the yearbook, but it was like another picture that had, they took on the campus of him. And he did get, well, most likely to remember, and he did actually put that quote. The quote means, after me, the flood. It doesn't mean after me, destruction. But I like how they, you know, kind of flipped it a little bit for the show to give us a little extra drama. Then we see Dad going to work, and he's at Maryland. So it's kind of like a parallel with him not fitting in at school and his dad not fitting in at work. So his dad is now working at a new place. You can tell it's not Merrill Lynch anymore. It's some type of, you know, lower stock broker, stock brokerage, stock, whatever you call those people, okay? So, uh, he in a damn cubicle. So, and he's on the phone with an old woman, and the old woman is, you know, you can tell she real old, and her grandson come in the house, and he cussed him, he cussed, um, Andrew Daddy out, like, the fuck is you doing? You ain't gonna be up in here. He like, what is you doing? You ain't gonna be up here stealing my grandma money. She is 90 years old, baby. And he hang up the phone and say he gonna find him in the streets. Don't let him catch you in these streets, honey, because he gonna beat that ass. Andrew and his mom are in the kitchen, and his mom asks him about a girlfriend because she noticed that he's wearing cologne. And he tells her that, what if I tell you she's over 30 years old? First of all, Andrew, what the f That's why I think you was getting molested. Second of all, mama, get yourself together, okay? Like, his mom, you can tell that she don't wanna, she don't wanna make no waves. So she just kind of agreed with she, cause like she paused, like, wait a minute, you ain't no bitch, hold up. Now nah, wait a minute now, you too young for that. But then she like readjusted herself, like, oh, well that's okay. I think that every man need to be with old. Like, girl, bye. You know you don't think that, and I don't believe you thought that. So Andrew goes to his room, he looks in the classroom, honey. He's getting his life, baby. He's giving us all the '80s moves, and I'm here for the shit, okay? So he dancing around the room, and he find him an outfit, and you can tell he he opened that closet and was like, boom, 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 bam. That's the one. We see him leaving his house in a row, but he gets into the car with an older gentleman. Now, the older dude say, hey, he give him a gift of cologne, and he said, you know, I, I mean, I know you give me gifts and everything, but that's not what this is about. You know, I want us to go somewhere special. He won't let me see his outfit, and then um, they pull up to this house party. So, dude is like, bitch, I'm married. I got a whole ass wife, and um, Key is at the house. I'm not gonna be at no house party, but you like, what you think this is? And Andrew is like, you know, I don't want us to be a secret no more and all of this. So I think that, mm, I couldn't tell if it was a part of his pathology of like exposing men, you know, because he knew the man was married when you go into the party. Or he was genuinely, he liked the dude, you know, and that was just like how his love got warped or whatever because it was interesting when the dude told him to get out. Dude tells him to get out the car, you know, he ain't got time for this, get out. And so he gives, he pulls money out to give it to him, but Andrew does not take it. Now later on in the series, or earlier on in the series, Andrew would have took that damn money in the heartbeat and bopped that man inside his head. But when he's a teenager, he didn't even take the money. You can tell he felt disrespected. So I wonder if he really actually liked this man or he, you know, it was just the beginning of his I'm fucking with you like I could expose you. You know what I'm saying? Time period. So I guess, I don't know. Y'all let me know what y'all think about that in the comments. Baby, when he got to that damn party, honey, he whipped that, he whipped that robe up. I said, you better walk, bitch. Okay, so he started walk. Boom, boom. He walked, baby. He hit the dance floor. Boom, bam, boom. Ah, girl, he did one move when he was like, you know, he started getting a little 
self-conscious like, and then he say, ah, bitch, move it. I said, you better do it. You better do it. And so Lizzie, his homegirl, you know, from later on, this is when they meet. So she at the party. She dancing and she like, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Hey, hey, I like that. She started feeling that vibe, okay? She felt his vibe. And so she went out there. She thought, mm, mm, mm. So later on, they talk at the party and she's like, you know, I gotta tell you a secret, I'm an imposter. So apparently Lizzie is a grown ass woman who is married and have a whole ass husband and she is babysitting this house for a couple of her friends who own the house. And she's talking about she just missed, you know, those times. Like what grown adult, you know, dresses up as a teenager and has a party for teenagers at her house? Girl, I cannot, okay, I cannot with these people. Uh, they start talking about, you know, what he wanna do when he get out of school and he said he wanna go start visiting all his idols like Basquiat, like, you know, this person and that person and Versace is at the end of that list. Interesting that he was drawn to Lizzie or they were drawn to each other being that they're both imposters. Also interesting because he said cannot seem to get along with people his own age. He only connects with older people and she's obviously at least a few years uh, older than him, old enough to be married and have a husband. So we back with Modesto. Modesto goes to work and he gets called into the office. Okay, homegirl, which I believe he was probably freaking on the side, okay? Said, listen, they about to call you in. So they called him in and they like, listen, you done stole more money from this old lady. You done, you know, she done, you done took this lady whole life savings or whatever. How many times has this happened? You don't go from Merrill Lynch to working here. Like, what's going on? What's happening? We need to know. We have questions. And he like, oh, I'm gonna clear it up, I'm gonna clear it up, I'm gonna clear it up. Y'all, this scene to me was so good. Like, this was classic Ryan Murphy. Ah, don't worry about it, it's nothing. You know, so he started walking back to his desk, people looking at him like, what you doing? You know what I'm saying? What you doing? What you doing, child? Well, I don't know, child. I heard you got called in the office, bitch. You know, that'll be me like this. I heard it. Listen, word on the curb is he out here sending people like, say this child. That's what the people say. I don't know. Okay, but Modesto Hall asked back to that office. He called his homegirl like, look, I need you to book this plane flight. He pulled out three, four credit cards. That's how you know you ain't got no money because you trying to lay it on all three cards, child. You doing a whole lot. So he gets up, he runs out the business. He gets in his car, he make it home. When he get home, he start, he grabs this money underneath the panel in the closet with um, a passport, and his wife is like, what the hell is going on? He knocks the shit out of her, okay, into the corner. He running out the house or whatever. The police walking up on the house right there. She answering the door. He running, running, running. He get out the back door. He, gro he jumps over the neighbor's fence and goes through their backyard to the street, or to the other street or something like that. And this is when Angel was pulling up after school and Andrew sees him he's like dad what's going on dad and y'all the y'all the funniest part to me was when he grabbed that boy keys it was like don't believe anything they say and he gonna grab your keys and left y'all got in the car and just drove away I said boy that's a no good scammer right there that's a low down dirty no good scammer right there for your ass boy I tell you and the mom is there and she like, listen, he sold the house weeks ago. He emptied all our bank accounts. He left us with no money. And Andrew is like, no, he would never do that. He would never leave us with no money. And that night he goes to bed upset and depressed. The next day he wakes up and he's on a mission. He start packing his bag. He's um, getting all his shit together. Mom was like, where are you going? She like, I'm going to find dad. She talking, talking, and he's scribbling on a piece of paper. They're listening like, you know, she's like, they ain't no plan. It ain't no it ain't no money hidden away. Your daddy is a liar and a thief, okay? And he left us with nothing. No, he didn't leave us with nothing. Yes, girl, he left us with nothing, girl. We don't have nothing. We don't even have nowhere to live, girl. And he like, I'm going, I'm going to go find him. So he actually goes. And in real life, this happened too. He got on the plane, he went to Manila. Now in real life, he stayed for like a month. On TV show, they make us think he only stayed for a day or a few days or something like that. So when he gets to Manila, he finds his father living with his uncle. And um, the father, he's not living in squalor, he just living in, it's very poor conditions, you know, mosquito nests all around, they eating very, you know, frugal type of meals and shit like this. So he get there with his dad, his dad is happy to see him. And at first he tried to keep up the lie and say, you know, there's millions stored away and you know your mama got a weak mind and don't believe what she say say he got to keep the shit out of reach where it's at it's out of reach where it's out of, it, 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 don't worry about that it's out of reach you don't worry about that okay and so later on that night they go to bed and Andrew is standing over him because he can't sleep and his dad wakes up and it's like you know I know it's the heat I'm used to it I've lived in it I've worked in it you know I played in it your body know where you belong even if you think you belong somewhere else 
And then he says, you know, I'm not, Andrew's like, I'm not, I can't be you, I can't be like you. And he like, why? I'm not good enough for you. Yeah, he said, I can't be like you. You a liar and a thief. And his dad is like, listen, my problem is not that I stole, it's that I didn't steal enough. He said, you can't come to America with nothing and, you know, make something. That's the lie that they tell you. So, yeah, I stole. And if I would have stole $100 million, they would have gave me a promotion instead of firing me. My problem was I didn't steal enough. I just stole small amounts, whatever I needed to be a father. And then he says, Andrew says, I can't be like you. And then he's like, I'm not good enough for you now. And he tells him, I brag to my friends about your success. So, if you're a liar, then I'm a liar. And, you know, I can't be a liar. He says he went to the library to look up Manila before he came and he said he was going to look up his dad on the top 25 stockbrokers in LA or something he said but I couldn't find it because it doesn't exist and then he starts crying and his dad I mean it's just like it's like a exact replica of when Andrew goes in on these old men like when they send for Andrew and then Andrew come for their ass okay it's just like that because as soon as he saw him crying he said you weak you like your mama he call him a sissy boy he tells him his mama ain't care nothing about seeing no book or no damn um him stealing on nothing when the money was coming in didn't nobody have shit to say okay they not upset because he stopped they're not upset because he was stealing and upset because he stopped stealing and now he got to go out and work with his sissy ass. Okay, I said, oh my God. He said he ashamed of him, his sissy special boy. He slapped Andrew in the face and Andrew pulled a knife on him and he like, do it, do it, you gonna kill me or whatever. And Andrew is holding a knife so hard that he's cut his own self but he says he'll never be like him. So Andrew goes back home the next day and the FBI is moving things out of the house. I think they seized and stuff from the house because it don't look like they was moving. It looked like they was getting their shit taken out the house because when Andrew goes into his room, there's nothing there. Okay, there's nothing there at all. And you can see Andrew counting his money before he even walked into the house. Like, this is all I have is the money that's in my pocket. That's it. So he goes to the um, house and he, like, throw a little fit. You know, he started kicking shit, knocking shit over, which is understandable because he's so, like, closed up. You know, Andrew is so closed up. It don't seem like anybody in that household really knew how to express emotions. You feel what I'm trying to say? Start kicking and knocking shit over or whatever. Later on that day, he goes to the Thrifty Mart where we know he ends up working and he applies for a job and a guy starts asking him questions about you know is he from the Philippines what part of the Philippines he from and all of this stuff and you can tell this is the genesis of what Andrew starts to lie now I don't know if he lied prior to this but it seems like this is when he started to lie because the truth he dealt with was way too much to deal with so instead of telling the truth I'll just tell a lie and he's that's when he starts to tell the lie about his dad is in the Philippines and he owns multiple pi pineapple plantations and the man at the 50 bar was looking at him like oh really bitch because my family is from Manila and if he had I would know you that but you know what all right okay Andrew all right and it's the beginning of people saying oh he be lying girl everybody know he be lying but we ain't gonna say nothing and say he killed like four people Okay, and that's how the episode went on. So, uh, like I said, it was more of the Andrew Kunanen story. We got very little Versace, y'all. I just accepted that this is the Andrew Kunanen story, and it's absolutely not the assassination of Gianni Versace. Um, I think it's probably because they couldn't have access to a lot of Versace things, so they probably couldn't tell the story the way they wanted to. And hell, if you can't get everything you want, then just leave the shit out and just do the best you can. You know what I'm saying? With all that being said, it was a good episode. Um, I'm excited. I think the finale is next week if I'm not mistaken I think the finale is next week so I'm not sure if this is episode eight or nine it's a really good episode so I want to hear what your thoughts are about it like I said the juxtaposition between it makes me think about when Gianni said the difference between me and you is that I am loved I think that Andrew uh, was raised in a really messed up way and because he was raised that way it warped his view of the world and I think maybe if he had been raised by different people because his dad was a straight-up comment now in hindsight I'm thinking like when we met the dad, the dad probably lied and schemed to get that house. He probably stole a whole lot more shit than what we what we think he did. You know what I'm saying? Andrew was just raised in a strange and weird environment. I'm not exactly sure. You, I'm not exactly sure if he would have turned out the same way had he been raised in a loving, supportive, normal home where you sleep in a room with your brothers and sisters and you know stuff like that. You did chores and whatnot. 
would he have been as messed up as he was. But it's still hard for me to feel sorry for him. I still don't feel sorry for him, y'all. You kill four people in cold blood because they hurt your feelings. And that's not cute. That's never cute. So I want to hear what you guys think about this episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and share my video with all your friends. And also hit that notification bell so you know because I've been, I've been trying to go live and stuff and everything. So you know, so you can see when the video is going to be there, alright? So I'll holler at y'all next week. Peace.